On September 26, 1957, the headline world record of 143 km per hour, JNR succeeds in high-speed test this morning appeared on the front page of the evening edition. The following day, the article announcing an update to 145 km per hour attracted attention. The high-speed test officials at the time were surprised to find that the public was highly interested in speed. Of course, there were no Shinkansen, airplanes were out of reach for the general public, and even though there were some cars, there were no highways. In those days, the norm for fast transportation was express trains. It was known to some extent that JNR was researching high-speed trains, and it was a time when the dream of super express trains was truly a dream. As introduced in a separate video, the SC train was developed by Odaku Electric Railway, with cooperation from the Railway Technical Research Institute of JNR, incorporating the latest EMU technology of the time. By adopting an articulated structure with the bogies placed at the joints of the car bodies, the floor height of the passenger compartment was lowered to 875 mm, achieving a low center of gravity. This was an effort more thorough than the Kiha 391 that appeared much later. Further reviewing the car body structure and adopting a thoroughly lightweight structure, the eight-car articulated set became compact with a total length of 108 meters. The weight of the set was kept to 147 tons even when empty, and the maximum axle load when loaded was kept to 9.95 tons. Considering that the axle load of motorized cars at the time reached 13.2 tons, this was an astonishingly lightweight design, bringing it close to the new generation lightweight passenger cars, the Naha 10. This lightweight nature significantly reduced track damage, which is said to be proportional to not just the square but the cube of axle load during high-speed operation, indicating extremely high potential as a high-speed train. To achieve stable braking force at high speeds, disc brakes were fully adopted, ensuring high braking performance when combined with electric brakes. It was only natural for engineers to want to conduct high-speed trials using this train, and demands for high-speed tests arose not only within Odaku but also within JNR. Odaku could only conduct high-speed trials up to about 120 km per hour due to track alignment, so it was suggested to use JNR lines, which allowed for higher speeds, for testing. However, the upper management did not think so simply. Odaku planned to introduce the train into commercial operation early, so they wanted to keep the rental period short. Moreover, as this was an unprecedented high-speed test, there was a risk that any issues with the train could damage Odaku's reputation, and in the worst case, the train itself could be damaged. On the other hand, JNR had a peculiar sense of pride. The authority consciousness and nationalist mindset ingrained since the days of the railway ministry often positioned them to guide private railways from a condescending standpoint. Some considered borrowing private railway cars to challenge the narrow-gauge world record as a matter of national pride. However, at the time, JNR had just prototyped the new performance commuter EMU Moha 90 and was trying to test its high-speed performance by changing the reduction ratio. Without a vehicle capable of high-speed running at 140 km per hour, they wanted to test the potential of high-speed EMUs by borrowing the SE train, regarded as the most advanced train in Japan. Thus, the decision was made to conduct tests on the Takedo main line. Since the rental period from Odaku was limited, considerable effort was required to prepare for large-scale tests in a short time. If they reached the target speed of 145 km per hour, even an emergency brake would take 860 meters to stop, violating regulations requiring a stop within 600 meters. Therefore, it was necessary to apply for special approval from the Ministry of Transport to conduct high-speed tests. The test sections were decided to be between Ofuna and Hiratsuka, and between Kanami and Numazu on the down line. The former included sections with long rails and compound catenary used for model lines. The latter had sections with normal tracks and simple catenary, allowing testing under different ground equipment conditions. On September 27, the test between Kanami and Numazu featured the unimaginable sight of invited guests riding during the day. The acceleration curve showed that it was extremely high performance for the time, 
capable of climbing a 25 per mile gradient at 90 km per hour and a 10 per mile gradient at over 110 km per hour. This performance was close to that of the 4M2T formation during the later high-speed trials of the 151 series. Even with this high-performance EMU, a decline in acceleration at high speeds was unavoidable, making it difficult to achieve the speed solely on flat sections. Therefore, the test sections were selected with straight sections having downhill gradients to compensate for the lack of acceleration at high speeds, similar to the selection for the 151 series high-speed tests. However, to achieve this speed, it was necessary to ignore curve limitations and turnout restrictions, leading to situations where guests felt the so-called lateral g-forces. The latest measuring equipment owned by the Technical Research Institute was prepared, and for the first time, an industrial television camera, which was rare at the time, was used to monitor the condition of the overhead wire and pantograph. Additionally, as the speed exceeded 100 km per hour, data was promptly reported and reviewed each time, and the speed was increased by 10 km per hour increments only after confirming safety. A wireless telephone connection was also established between the test train and the substation, allowing immediate power cutoff in the event of an accident. In this way, speed was gradually increased, and measurements were taken for vehicle vibration, airflow along the car body and roof, current collection conditions, track impact, and train wind intensity. The lateral force, a problem when passing through curves and turnouts at high speed, was kept to a maximum of 2.5 tons. The derailment coefficient, expressed as the ratio of lateral force to wheel load, was low at 0.62, indicating room for further speed improvement. The reduction in lateral force was effectively due to the light axle load, with the influence of the bogey structure being unclear. The force exerted on the turnout fixing bolts during turnout passage showed a low value, nearly half of that for conventional passenger trains, indicating less track damage. On the other hand, the force exerted on the rail when passing rail joints showed values not much different from those of conventional vehicles. The vibration of the car body increased with speed but was significantly less compared to the Series 80 EMUs. Particularly on the model section with long rails, vibrations decreased, demonstrating the effectiveness of long rails. The Ride Comfort Index, calculated from the vertical and lateral vibration acceleration and its frequency, was also lower and better than that of the Series 80 EMUs. However, the values during turnout passage were sometimes much worse than the Series 80, especially in the leading car. The low vibration acceleration might have caused the vibration frequency to affect the index. The running resistance was considerably lower than the Series 80, with minimal increase at high speeds. For the first time, a pitot tube and manometer were used on a running train to investigate wind pressure distribution. It was found that the boundary layer of the airflow on the sides was thin, about half to one-third of that of conventional vehicles. On the other hand, data showed that the boundary layer of the airflow on the roof was thick, indicating possible significant airflow disturbance due to poor roof shaping. Regarding the train wind caused by passing trains, low values were recorded at 50 cm from the train side, about half to one-third of the values recorded during the high-speed tests with the EH-10. In terms of current collection, there were almost no issues in the compound catenary section. However, even with active maintenance, the simple catenary section between Kanami and Numazu was limited to about 120 km per hour. These results indicated that there was still considerable room for improvement in car body strength and bogey strength, suggesting the possibility of further weight reduction. Based on these series of high-speed tests and the curb passage performance on the Odaku line, Odaku gained confidence in articulated trains. Despite the restrictions on formation flexibility and operational constraints, Odaku adopted articulated trains for its flagship trains over the long term. Meanwhile, JNR stubbornly adhered to conventional methods. In the 1970s, when the limits of speed improvement were reached, JNR temporarily experimented with articulated trains like the Kuemoha 591 and Kiha 391. However, these did not translate into mass-produced cars. 
Articles and reports from that time are filled with expressions that show the engineers' big dreams of developing and commercializing new technologies. In some ways, it was a dynamic world full of vitality, unlike today's industrial technology scene, which is often seen as focused solely on decarbonization.